عبد الرحمن الأول. So we'll be giving you some questions uh, for pulmonary anatomy uh, practice questions. I know I sound a bit sick, but you have to bear with me. Um, anyway, so for my end, I'll be talking about the anatomy of the lungs and the pleura. And Abd Rahman will be talking about the mediastinum along with the like innervation. So uh, we decided that uh, I'll go first um, to be able to correlate the uh, like the the questions. Um, I hope this would be helpful. If you do have any questions, uh, do let us know. We also put like our numbers here. Um, and yeah, so we want you to do like uh, the best on your exam. And again, this is the whole point of PAL sessions. So let's get started. Um, so how uh, I want it to be, so I'll, if, if you guys want to read the question, sure. Um, but I don't want anyone to answer. Uh, I want you guys to write down in chat what you think the answer is. Um, but try to send it to me because I don't want you guys to see other, uh, like the answer of other people. All right. Sounds good. Yes. Oh. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's get started with the first question. Um, all right. So can someone read it? A 75-year-old patient had been suffering from lung cancer located near the cardiac notch, a deep indentation on the lung. Which of the following lobes is most likely to be excised? Okay. Um, so can you please send me down, like, can you, can you send it to me? Okay. All right. I want you all guys to answer the question, so. I only have two answers for now. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of E's and one C. So now this is a bit of a tricky question. So the, the answer is because, okay, so the answer is not E, it's D, all right? Um, no, as I said, it's a bit of a tr tricky question because the left lung. So, okay, so let's talk. Let's talk. I'll, I'll explain it like deeply. Okay. So, when we talk about the left lung, so this is the left lung and this is the right lung. Okay. Can you see my cursor like the on the screen? Yeah. Okay. So, when we talk about the left lung, okay, this is the left lung and this is the right lung. The left lung is only divided into two parts, which is the superior and the inferior lobe, right? Or the upper lobe and the middle lobe, or the upper lobe and the lower lobe. So because of that, it's not it's not quite the same as the right uh, lung. The right lung is uh, the right the right lung is divided into three parts, which is the upper lobe, the middle lobe, and the and the lower lobe. So if you look right here at the left lung, if you if you see here the cardiac notch as well as the what we call the lingula, which is right here as well, are part of the superior lobe. And I put this question because. Um, like in the actual uh, presentation, it doesn't say where it doesn't say exactly where it is. It just says, uh, look here in the lingula. It just says it corresponds to the middle lobe of the right lung. And this is this is true. But is it part of the upper lobe or is it part of the lower lobe? And this is important to keep in mind that it is part of the upper lobe or the superior lobe. So um, and obviously, so th this uh, like for this picture right here, I want you guys to find the differences between the right lung and the left lung. So there, obviously the left lung has the cardiac notch and the lingula, which is right here again. Um, and the right lung does not have that. Also, another difference is that the right lung is divided into three. Um, it's divided into three lobes uh, by two fissures, which is the horizontal and the oblique fissure. However, the left lung is only divided into two lobes. Uh, via the oblique fissure. So I want you, I want you guys to keep these differences in mind. And um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Do you guys, do you guys understand the question? Do you guys understand? Now I do understand why a lot of you put E because uh, I would think like it's at the very bottom, so it's part of the inferior lobe. But this is not how it works. It's like it's separated by the fissure, so um, it's still part of the superior lobe, but at the bottom of the superior lobe. All right. All right. Um, okay, so next question. All right, so can someone else read it? Or if I can read it, if you guys want, so uh, I'll read it. Okay, a five-year-old boy had been playing with his little race cars. Okay, soon after he put a wheel from one of, his, uh, from one of the cars in his mouth, 
He began choking and coughing. Where in the trachea, where in the trachea bronchial tree is the most common site for a foreign object to lodge? Okay. So I put this question because it, you will be tested on this. It's very common. So, okay. All right. So most of you said A, and I'm and I'm happy you like you do know that this is a very important point. So it is A because um, so because the right so the difference again we talked about the difference between the right lung and the left lung. So the difference between the right uh, bronchus and the right, left primary bronchus. Now this is where it's said in your um, in your presentation, but I decided to I, to add that from first A. So it, the reason the reason. Um, anything you take, anything foreign you take, in, whether it was uh, peanuts, whether it was uh, anything foreign, any foreign object, it's more likely to go to the right lung. It can go to the left, uh, to the right bronchus. It can go to the left, but if you do get a question, you always go for the right one. Now, I do remember last year we got a question. It was uh, an OSPI question, uh, but you will you'll, you'll, you'll have a session tomorrow about OSPI, but just to orient you guys. So we did have a question about this. It asked us, uh, so someone uh, inhaled something foreign and uh, where where is it more, more likely to be? And they got a question, uh, they got like a, a picture of the right lung and the left lung and they told us to, to choose which lung. So you have to always go for the right lung because of the right primary bronchus, okay? So, and why is it right, right primary bronchus? Because the right primary bronchus is wider, more vertical and shorter than the left. Another thing that you have to keep in mind, like a more vertical is the most important thing because uh, it's it's straight, it's more straight. So because it's more straight, it's more likely to go through, right? And because it's wider, it's more likely to go through as well, okay? So I'm assuming everyone understands that because everyone uh, was able to answer the question, okay? Now, I, this, uh, now there's this point right here that while supine, it goes to a specific segment of the right lobe um, while uh, standing, it goes to a different segment, but I'm not sure if you have to know this because uh, one sec. Because here it just said when you when like the person is uh, in a vertical position, it goes into the posterior basal segment, which is the uh, bronchopulmonary segment. So, uh, so I'm not sure. So I'm not entirely sure if you have to know these. Just keep in mind, and if we're an object, right primary bronchus. Okay. All right. Uh, next question. Okay. Now, this is a very similar question, but again, I said it's a very important point, so I wanted to emphasize on this. Okay, so can you please send me your answers? Okay. Okay. Okay, I need more answers. Come on, guys. Okay, one more answer and then I'll explain it. Okay, so... Basically, all of you put the answer B. So as I explained previously, so the, the question is, a 51-year-old female with a history of brain tumor and associated severe oropharyngeal dysphagia develops right lower lobe pneumonia after an episode of vomiting. Which of the following is the best reason that this type of aspiration pneumonia most commonly affects the right lower lung lobe? So it's basically the exact same thing as the, uh, it's basically the exact same concept as the previous question uh, that you always go for the right uh, main focus because it's wider, it's straighter, and it's uh, so mainly wider and straighter, but you can say it because it's shorter, but uh, you always go for straighter and wider, okay? Because, I mean, there are like two openings and one is more wide than the other and one is uh, uh, like it's more wide and it's more vertical, so you're more likely to have it on the right, uh, like the right side, okay? Um, okay, so yeah, uh, B is the right answer. Okay, so so before we get into a new concept, is everything fine till now? Before we get this concept, is everything fine till now? Okay, so till now we explained two major concepts, okay? And they're very important because you will get tested on them. Okay, so now uh, question number four. 
Um, okay. A 46 year old patient comes to the doc. Wait, I'm kidding. Okay, comes to his doctor's office and complains of chest pain and headache. A CT scan reveals the tumor located just superior to the root of the brain lung. A blood flow in which of the following veins is most likely blocked by this tumor? Okay, so can you write your answers down, please? Okay. Not C, okay. So a lot of you said B. Uh, okay, someone said D, and someone said uh, someone said A. Okay, so so this question, if you look right here, it's asking it's if you read like the the last part, blood flow in which of the following veins is most likely blocked by this tumor. Okay, so it's asking about a vein, and the choices are veins. Then if you go here, it says that there is a tumor, it's just superior to the root of the right lung. Okay, so the first thing that you wanna think of is the structures that are found in the right lung and in the root of the right lung. So when we talk about the root, so before I get into that, I have a question. Do you guys know what, what is the difference between a root uh, and the hilum of the lung? So can someone, can someone explain that? The root of the lung and the hilum of the lung. Okay. Uh, okay, so basically, when we talk about the hilum of the lung, uh, because as we know, obviously, there is a lung and there is a bronchus going through the lung with the pulmonary veins, pulmonary arteries going through the lung as well, right? So when we talk about the hilum of the lung, it's exactly, it's where the, it's where, not the vessels, it's where all these structures get into the lung, including the vessels. So the pulmonary veins and the pulmonary artery, as well as the bronchus, okay? Now, when I say the root of the lung, I'm referring to the, to the, to these specific structures and not to the, like, not to the actual place, but these structures. So, for example, here it said, um, there is a tumor located to the root of the right lung. So there are structures at the root, uh, so the root of the right lung, the structures at the root of the right lung. Again, I, I said it could be anything, right? It could be anything entering into the lung. So, um, okay, so the first thing they wanna think of in this question, okay, so what are these structures and what, it, what could be superior to the root of the right lung? So we know that the, uh, that the right lung Okay, wait one sec. Okay, so we know that the right lung, obviously it has, so the right lung and the left lung. The right lung has the arch of the vagus as well as the subclavian, right? Now, subclavian could be tricky, but you usually go for arch of the because it's directly, uh, it's directly superior to it, okay? So for example, so this is B, as I said, arch of the because if you look right here, so this is the right lung. It was asking this question about the right lung. And it said, okay, the root of the right lung. As I said, what is the root? It's the structures going through going through the lung. So the structures in the right lung, uh, bronchus plus the pulmonary artery plus the two pulmonary veins, okay? So what is directly superior to it? It's the arch of azygous. As I said, right subclavian vein could be tricky, but uh, but like it's a branch of the superior, the uh, the superior vena cava, right? So that is why you go for it. It's directly superior to it. That is why you go for the uh, azygous vein. Now, what I why why I put this question is uh, because um, I want you guys to know like the structures found in the right lung and the structures found in the left lung. Now, for the right lung and the left lung, the root, as I said, the structures going directly into it are the exact same thing. However, the like the arrangement are different. And I want you guys to know that because, uh, again, in OSPI or in other questions, uh, they, you need to know the arrangement of these. Uh, you need to uh, you need to know the arrangement of these structures to know what they're talking about. You know the what they're talking if they're talking about the right or the left lung. Okay, so in the right lung, the like at the superior part, there is the bronchus. Then comes the pulmonary artery. Then comes the veins. So this is the arrangement: bronchus, artery, then vein. Pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, which is BAV basically. Uh, okay, I'll go back to the answer. Wait. Um, okay. On the left lung, however, it's A, B, and V. So, Archie, then bronchus, then the vein. Um, so, 
I mean, you could use this BAV or uh, ABV. So it's basically just the opposite way around, BAV and ABV, okay? So you have to know BAV, superior to inferior, bronchus, artery, vein. Um, ABV on the left lung, artery, bronchus, and vein. All right, sounds good. Now, uh, so you know that now we know that now we know the arrangement of the root of each lung. Okay, so now let's talk about the mediastinal surface. The mediastinal surface, obviously, it's the surface which is um, towards the mediastinum. Okay, so in the mediastinal surface, we have two main things: the azygous vein on the right lung, as well as the uh, superior vena cava. Okay, now these are the demarcations, or these are uh, so you could think of it as uh, things that pass through it and they cause um, like a, a mark on it. This is what we call it. But in the lab, uh, you have to figure these out. You have to understand, okay, this is right here. This is right there, okay? Uh, I'm assuming you already uh, did this in the lab. Now for the left lung, okay, so if you look right here, okay, this superior to it is the aortic arch and the left subclavian artery, which is part of the aortic arch. However, if you do get a question, it's probably going to be the aortic arch. So again, superior to the mediastinal surface, uh, superior um, to the root uh, in the left lung, in the right lung is the azygous vein and the superior vena cava. Uh, for the left lung, superior to the root is the aortic arch as well as the left subclavian. Now, how you can think, because obviously to the left and uh, like, uh, for, for example, with the cardiac notch for how the, uh, for how the aorta is going and the aortic arch is going, it's going towards the left. So that is how you can think of it. Okay, left side. And on the right side, azygous and superior vena cava. Now, when we go back to this question, it was asking about, sorry. Okay, so when we go back to this question, it was asking, it was telling you that there is a tumor. And this tumor, it was located just superior to the root of the right lung. Okay, so right lung, what is superior, what is uh, in the root of the right, what is, uh, what is found in the right lung? It's the azygous vein and the uh, superior vena cava. So, you're going to immediately go. You're going to immediately go for the arch of the azygous vein. Okay, so does that make sense? Now, if this was, for example, let's assume it was the the root of the left lung, if, like this question said, the root of the left lung. The root of the left lung. You're going to directly go for. You're going to go for what? If if it was left lung, what what will you go for? Aortic arch. Aortic arch, exactly. So. Um, is everything clear for this question? I want you guys to understand the concept of why I included this question and what you need to know for it, like uh, when you think about this question. So is that is that clear? Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so next question. Now this is uh, this is a bit of a tricky question. You might you probably would know this because I think you already took it with uh, Dr. Simon. So you might need to use that. Okay, so a 56 year old uh, man with a one pack uh, with, a, with a one pack per day history of cigarette smoking is found to have a malignant squ uh, squamous cell carcinoma located in the superior sulcus of pancos, which is the superior apex of the lung. Uh, shortly after the diagnosis is known. The patient develops uh, develops symptoms that consist of shoulder pain, along with ptosis, meiosis, and ophthalmos, and then hydrosis. Uh, which of the following nerves is most likely compressed by the tumor mass? Okay, so okay, can you like? Oh. <clears throat> okay. Can you write down your questions? Your answer, please. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of C's. I'm seeing an A. Okay, so, um, so the person who put A, can you can you tell me why you think it's A? <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so the answer is left shoulder. Okay, C, C because it's Horner's syndrome. Okay, that is true. Okay, so, uh, okay, so it's C because it, it's, it is, it is Horner's syndrome. So 
remember when uh so in do and i'm not sure which lecture but i'm not sure who taught you this i think dr olin i'm not sure what her name is anyways so when we when she talked about the pancos tumor remember uh, the pancos tumor is basically the bronchogenic tumor okay and she said like in the PowerPoint that it could cause uh, Horner syndrome, it could cause uh, uh, the aortic arch uh, or the uh, thor thoracic out outlet syndrome. So this is a case where it causes um, shoulder pain. Now it does cause shoulder pain and you said it causes shoulder pain and less shoulder pain, right? So it does cause shoulder pain. However, the question is asking, um, like it, it, sh it shows that there is ptosis, meiosis, and ophthalmos, and then hydrosis. So mainly, this the uh, like the the main thing that they developed after that is Horner syndrome, and because Horner syndrome, sorry, okay, and because it was Horner syndrome, um, the, so you can ignore pancos, but I just included it because uh, it was in your lecture that pancos, but it just asking about Horner syndrome. So Horner syndrome is is most likely going to compress the sympathetic trunk. So as you can see here, um, it was shown here. Um, in case you were not aware of this, um, another name for bronchogenic carcinoma is Pankos tumor, okay? Um, because it, it's in red and it wasn't in the title, so I thought some of you might not, um, uh, might not recognize that. So it can lead to thoracic outlet syndrome as, as well as Horner syndrome, which is ptosis, meiosis, hemanhydrosis, um, which was the which was exactly the case here. So uh, ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis, and ophthalmos, it's exactly the same thing. So because of Horner syndrome, Horner syndrome is due to uh, the cervical sympathetic trunk. A trunk, I'm assuming the, uh, you already took that. So uh, is that clear uh, for this question? Okay, so, all right. All right, that's good. All right. So now another concept, which is another very important concept. Okay, another very important concept. All right. Um, a 34-year-old man with a complaint of uh, sharp localized pain over the, thoracic, the thoracic wall is diagnosed with pleural effusion, through which intercostal space along the mid-scapular line is it most appropriate to insert a needle to drain the effusion fluid? Okay, so that's uh, another important concept. So... Okay, I'm seeing uh, A, E, D, B, C. <laughs> I'm seeing everything, basically. E, A. Okay, so can someone can someone explain it? Because uh, I'm seeing a lot of different answers. So can someone explain uh, why they put their answer? Um, I did it because I think that this is describing thoracosynthesis, which is supposed to be done between the seventh and ninth intercostal space, mid clavicular line, I think, or mid axillary line, sorry. Okay. Uh, what did you put again? I put seventh. All right, so you said uh, you put seventh because it was you thought it was uh, uh, mid clavicular line, right? Uh, sorry, mid axillary. No, no, no. Uh, it's uh, okay. So mid clavicular is uh, sixth to eighth, and mid axillary it's eighth is eighth to tenth. All right, and oh. uh, so, but this question is not. This question is, if you look right here, this question is asking about mid scapular line. So mid scapular line is basically perivertebral line. Okay, so what what it what's the okay? It's the question is exactly asking about thoracosynthesis. It's asking about the needle where you need to insert the needle to drain the uh, fluid, right? Okay, so you need to you need to find out first which line it's asking about. So it's asking if it's asking about the midclavicular line, then sure, it, it's it's uh, it's so it's between six and eight, so it's seven. Okay, however, it's not asking about that. It's asking about midscapular line or paravertebral line. So what? So in your lecture, it was found. So you tell me what what's what's written in your lecture if it's mid uh, if it's paravertebral. Uh, 10 to 12. Okay, 10 to 12. So perivertebral is 10 to 12. So 10 and uh, 10, so it's A and E would both be correct. So because sometimes when uh, sometimes when they tell you, okay, so 10 to 12, or uh, um, you always go to the number in between because sometimes they're not accurate 100%. But uh, so for example, here, like here the answer is, 
um, wait, it's it's 11th, right? Because it's between 10th to 12. So if you do get 10 to 12 and you do get 11 and uh, 10, you always go for it in the number in between because uh, it's it, it's a range and the like the top and the bottom are not 100%. But if let's assume 11 was not there, let's assume 11th was not there. If 11th was not there, you're going to go for 10th, obviously. However, if if you do get both, you're going to go for the more accurate one, which is 11th. Or the if you let, let's say I'm trying to get, I'm trying to uh, let's say someone is actually trying to do it, and um, uh, you're you want to go for the more safe option, right? So you're going to obviously go for the 11th because you're not 100% like for the 10th, you're not 100% going to uh, you're not 100% sure that uh, you're not going to hurt any organs, you're not going to hurt any like uh, you're the lung, the actual lung. So you want to go through 100. You want to be 100 sure that you're going to go through the uh, pleural cavity. Th does that make sense? Okay. So I know it's a bit confusing because um, 11th and 10th would uh, would work. So even if someone puts like uh, 10th, even if someone puts 10th, um. Like I, I I don't know if they're gonna accept it to be honest, but you could appeal it and uh, uh, you could like uh, they could accept it, but well because this was um a previous question and um I thought like um uh, with eleventh and tenth it could be confusing that's why I decided to include it okay so all right another question so again it's thoracocentesis um you go for eleventh already explained that so th this might help you actually. Uh, this was from last year's Dr. Altus lecture. Uh, so midclavicular line, it's uh, six to eight. Uh, mid axillary line, eighth to tenth, intercostal spaces, and uh, tenth to twelve, intercostal space for mid scapular line or paravertebral line. Okay. So if you see mid scapular line, it's exactly the same as uh, paravertebral. All right. Um, okay. So next question. Uh, a 32-year-old patient has a tension pneumothorax. Now, before I actually get into this, um, Dr. Uh, Aline, I don't know, she explained uh, what a tension pneumothorax is when basically uh, she said that when a flap doesn't, when a flap closes and uh, the when you expire it, it doesn't, like uh, the actual breath doesn't go out, right? Uh, through the wound or through the um, stab or whatever. So this is what's referred to as tension pneumothorax. But I didn't find a, like an exact question uh, asking about that. So I thought I would explain this. Then I would let you answer the question. So a 32-year-old patient has a tension pneumothorax uh, that can be treated with needle aspiration. To avoid an injury of the intercostal neurovascular bundle, uh, the needle may be inserted in which of the following locations. So, okay, so this is a different uh, concept, but there will be a concept of tension pneumothorax after. Okay, so... Okay, so A, A, A. Uh, okay, someone said B. Okay, so a lot of you said A. Okay, so um, can whoever said B, can you can you explain why you said B? Uh, deep to the upper border of the ribs. Okay, um, so the answer is A, uh, which is above the upper border of the ribs. Now, um, a lot of you, okay, so this is an important point as well, because um, this is also asking about thoracosynthesis as here, as we said here. And in, in your lecture, it said uh, you go for the upper border of the rib because you want to, because you don't want to injure the intercostal uh, nerve, bundle, uh, nerve bundle. And as you can see here um, in this figure right, on the right, you can see that a lot of them um, are not right, are not exactly through the middle. There, some of them are up, some of them are down. But mainly, when the when you get a question, you always go for the right, the upper, um, like for the border, for the upper border of the rib. Okay. Another way they can get the question is that because the upper border of the rib is exactly the same as the lower of uh, the lower part of the intercostal space, right? So the lower part of the intercostal space. So if the, that question had lower part of the intercostal space instead of the upper border of the ribs, you would go for that. Okay. So this could be a bit confusing or this could be um like unrecognized, but you always have to think, okay, you go for the lower border, you go for the upper border of the rib, which is exactly the same as the lower border of the uh, or the lower part of the intercostal space, okay? Um, 
So I hope this uh, I hope this concept is clear. Is that is that clear? Like the upper border of the rib with the lower part of the intercostal space. Because um, I think we got we got a question similar to this last year, and it was in our PowerPoint, but I didn't find it in your PowerPoint. So I thought I would explain that. Okay. Uh, clear, clear. Okay, sounds good. All right. Next question. Oops. All right. It's okay. I forgot to remove that. Anyways, so it's fine. Um, I want you guys, can someone read it and explain? I want someone to explain why the answer is A. Okay, so 49 year old woman has a neoplasm in, high, in the hilum of the lung anterior to the primary bronchus. Which of the lung structures would be compressed if the neoplasm continues to go anteriorly? And phrenic because the phrenic nerve runs anterior to the root of the lung. Okay, so um, remember. Okay, so what? So what supplies the uh, coastal surface of the? Uh, oh, sorry. Phrenic nerve. Okay, so the phrenic nerve, it supplies the mediastinal, sur uh, mediastinal surface because as you know, like the lung, uh, it has the mediastinal surface, the coastal surface, and the diaphragmatic surface. So the, uh, the, uh, the coastal surface is supplied by the intercoastal nerve. Um, the medial surface is supplied by the uh, phrenic nerve. Okay, and the diaphragmatic surface, it's basically a mixture of the phrenic. Um, and it's, it's basically... Uh, you have to look for the coastal and the phrenic. Um, for example, on the on the inf very inferior side, it's supplied by the coastal intercoastal uh, intercoastal nerve. But uh, the main thing is the phrenic nerve. Now, for this question, it's asking uh, which of the following uh, structures would be would be compressed if the neoplasm grows uh, continues to grow anteriorly and anterior to the primary bronchus. So if, if we're talking about anterior to the prim primary bronchus, so it's asking about primary bronchus where, so because you see anterior, it could be a bit um, misleading. So when we talk about anterior, it's asking about anterior to the primary bronchus. The primary br bronchus is found in the mediastinal surface. So technically the question is asking about the mediastinal surface, okay? So what supplies the mediastinal surface? It's the phrenic nerve, all right, sounds good. Okay, now, um, all right, so again, this is just a picture to understand, to orient you guys. So this is the high, this is the root. Uh, this is the root of the uh, lung. And um, obviously anterior to it is the phrenic nerve. Now, another point that you wanna keep in mind is that what supplies the mediastinal surface also supplies the, uh, the, the mediastinal pleura. Remember when we said, okay, so you have a pleura, uh, you have the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. The visceral pleura is basically the one which is stuck to the lung or um, attached directly to the lung. And because it's attached directly to, directly to the lung, it has the same innervation as the lung, which is the autonomic nerve supply. Now for the parietal pleura, um, we have like three different parts, the coastal pleura, mediastinal, and diaphragmatic. Okay, as I said previously, the coastal part of the lung or the coastal, um, not the coastal part of the lung, the coastal wall, because it's a parietal pleura, it's not directly attached to the lung, right? So the coastal wall or the coastal part of the chest wall is supplied by the intercoastal nerves. As a result, the coastal pleura is also supplied by the intercoastal nerves. Now, mediastinal pleura. Mediastinal pleura is also supplied by the phrenic nerve because the mediastinal part of the, uh, or the mediastinal towards the mediastinum, it's also supplied by the phrenic nerve. The diaphragmatic, it's exact same thing. So this is a, a way to understand uh, this is a way to keep in mind uh, how you relate the pleura with the lung, okay? Because you might get a question and you might be lost about, okay, so this supplies the lung or this supplies the pleura, but does it also supply the lung? It's the exact same. Uh, so it's the exact same part. So one part corresponds to the other part, okay? So um, uh, does that make sense? Like this part right here? Okay. Um, all right, so next question, and uh, this is the last question. Now, this is where I talked about, um, okay, so I'll read a question. A 17-year-old semi-conscious student was brought to the ER with a stab injury in the chest uh, during a fight. On physical examination, his neck veins were grossly engorged. A radiograph of the chest showed collapsed right lung and a tracheal deviation to the left side. Which of the following is most likely the condition? 
Now, um, you did not take that exactly, but she did explain that. And uh, okay. So just try your best. Um, I just added I just added this question to clarify some things which might be confusing. So okay. So some some are saying B, some are saying C. Okay. B, B. All right. So okay, so it's B because um so in the lecture, um she said that okay, like the what the one I talked about where basically it doesn't does not close. Um, so it, it's a pneumothorax. The first thing that you want to know, it's a pneumothorax. And that is because uh, there is a stab injury in the chest. So when there's a, a stab injury in the chest, there's going to be a wound. And uh, when you breathe in, a lot of air is going to go in, right? So when a lot of air is going to go in, the negative pressure between the, uh, the cavity, pleural cavity, and the lung is gone. As a result, the uh, the lung is going to collapse because remember the fact that the lung is elastic, it, it recoils, right? So when it recoils, it's gonna, uh, so when the pressure is gone, not, nothing is gonna stop it from recoiling. As a result, it's going to collapse. So this is what we call pneumothorax. Now, if you look right here, it also said, okay, so showed a collapse right lung. So this is a pneumothorax. It also said something additional, a tracheal deviation towards the left side. Now, when this happens, when the when the uh, something closes the wound from outside, the like the air is going to keep on building up. It keeps on building up to the point that it will it will uh, basically um, collapse or it will uh, uh, it will hit on the things which are found in the mediastinum, including the trachea. Okay, so if it did not say uh, tra uh, tracheal deviation towards the left side, this would not be tension pneumothorax. Okay, and this is important to keep in mind because in tension pneumothorax, you will compress on other stuff in the mediastinum. It could be any other thing. It, it not like it's not necessarily the uh, the tracheal uh, trachea, or right? like it's it should it could be any other thing in the mediastinum. Okay, with a collapsed lung, uh, this is immediately tension pneumothorax. Um, so this could not like this is not necessarily like this might not come in the exam, but if it does, um, just make sure you do you do focus on okay. So there is a collapsed lung, and if there is a collapsed lung, is there any other thing which is affected in the mediastinum? If not, then should this should be open pneumothorax, okay, which you took in the lecture. So if you look right here, okay, this is the open pneumothorax again. Um, it's due to uh, it's due to a stab in the chest. It's due to anything which makes a wound in the chest and uh, which causes okay you breathe in and it causes the uh, collapse in the lung, which is right here. And uh, um, I think I think you will get the this X ray because in our exam and uh, um, like third year uh, second year exams in our uh, neurology exam, Doctor uh, Vlad uh, got us an X ray, which is the exact same as the as the uh, PowerPoint. Um, and I'm assuming like uh, Dr. Aline is the exact same thing. So make sure you do know what the uh, like the uh, actual x-rays are. And uh, okay, so if you do, if you do not memorize them if, or if you didn't memorize them, okay, so you can see here, okay, this is the first lung. The second lung, it looks way more collapsed. And because obviously it's collapsed, this could refer to as pneumothorax. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So you guys have, uh, do you guys have any questions in your lecture? Any other questions? Is that, is that point of pneumothorax clear? All right, clear, clear. Okay, do you have any questions in your lecture? I tried to cover like the most important stuff in these two lectures um, and what like uh, clinically would be relevant. So if you do have any questions, just let me know. Um, okay, so. Here, I just put uh, an additional one about pneumothorax. All right, sounds good. All right, you're welcome. Um, I do have my my details or my number at the like at the first slide. So if you do have any questions, um, uh, don't hesitate to text me, or if you do see me at uni or whatever you want. So good luck in your exam, and I hope you all do well. And uh, thank you for attending. Now, um, Abdurrahman al will uh, talk about the rest. He'll be talking about mediastinum as well as the uh, the innervation. Uh, good luck. Thank you, Fahd. Good luck. Uh, okay, hello, guys. My name is Abdurrahman. I'm a second year medical student. That will take over now. Uh, so let me share my screen real quick. Okay, so the lectures I'll be doing are the mediastinum lecture and uh, the innervation of the uh, pleural cavity, like the area around there. 
So one second, let me just open up the chat so I can check your guys. So we'll do the same thing as Khaled did. Uh, when you guys answer the, when you guys read the question and before answering, just text me the answer uh, in the private chat so that everyone can get a chance to answer the questions. And if you have any questions when explaining, you can pause me and then I'll explain it again. I have no worries. And okay, so let's get started. So this is the first question in the media sign lecture. Uh, does anyone like to read the question? Um, okay, so you are attending an operation to remove the thymic tumor from the superior mediastinum. The surgeon asks, what important nerve lying on and partly curving the posteri curving posteriorly around the arch of the aorta should be careful of as we remove this mass? You quickly answer, Lee. Okay, you guys can send me your answers now. I got four answers. Let me give you guys like 10 seconds. I think you guys got it. Uh, all right, yeah, so most of you got the question right. Now the answer is C, as you guys said, it's the left recurrent pharyngeal nerve. Uh, okay, so there is a clue, like the most important clue in this part, you don't need to care about the superior mediastinum. Your clue is the arch of the aorta that the, arch, the nerve is curving around the arch of the aorta. So the only nerve that does that is the left recurrent pharyngeal nerve. So I think you guys got this, so which is good. Now, this is a really important topic, the, the curving around the aorta, so like make sure you know it. Now, this is the superior media spine. I'm gonna go over it real quick uh, so that you guys don't have questions about it in case anything else comes. Now, the structures found in the superior media spine, there is all these structures, but just don't worry about these. The only thing that you want to know from this list is the left recurrent pharyngeal nerve. Now, how do you know the other stuff in case you had any type of cross-section pictures or stuff? So. The organization of the superior mediastinum is going to be, the thymus is going to be the most anteriorly, all right? Behind the thymus, you're going to have the veins, two veins, the brachiocephalic vein. The brachiocephalic veins are really important, and we have another question to discuss the clinical significance of the brachiocephalic veins. Behind the veins, you're going to have the arteries. Now, you could have a lower section where you could get the entire arch of the aorta, or you could have a higher section where you could get the three vessels, which are your brachiocephalic, your left common carotid, and your left subclavian. And then behind the arteries, you're going to have the trachea and the esophagus. Now, knowing the organization is really important. And one way to like remember that the trachea always comes in front of the esophagus is that you know how the trachea is going to bifurcate to give off the lungs. Now, imagine there was an esophagus in front of the trachea. So while it's bifurcating, and the lungs are forming, they're going to be pressing on the esophagus, and that would be bad for the body, right? That's why the esophagus is usually behind the trachea, so that it can bifurcate freely without any compressions. And so we have behind the trachea immediately is going to be the esophagus. And an important point to remember is that the trachea is only found in the superior mediastinum, okay? So when we go to the inferior mediastinum, you're going to have the lungs, okay? So there's no more trachea. And the last structure that we got is going to be your thoracic duct. The thoracic duct always, always, always comes behind the esophagus, all right? So again, the structures of the superior mediastinum, you know the thymus, there's the veins, and then the arteries, and then you got the esophagus, uh, I mean the trachea, and the esophagus, and always behind the esophagus is going to be your thoracic, thoracic duct, right? And then the left recurrent pharyngeal nerve, which are your vagus nerves and the recurrent pharyngeal nerves. Uh, important point to remember also is the left recurrent and the right recurrent pharyngeal nerves. Now, this would be focused more on embryology, but I'm going to go over it real quick here so that you can remember this point, that the left recurrent pharyngeal nerve is going to be passing under and behind uh, under and behind your aortic arch, while the right recurrent pharyngeal nerve is going to be around the right subclavian artery. Now, our mediastinum area is going to be around here, right? So we're going to have the left recurrent pharyngeal nerve but the right recurrent pharyngeal nerve goes above the mediastinum. So it's not going to be included in any of the mediastinums, okay? So any superior mediastinum questions is going to be associated most likely with the left recurrent pharyngeal nerves or the brachiocephalic veins that we'll discuss in a second, okay? So, and then this is the last point I'm going to bring in regards to this question is that the previous, the, uh, in the actual question that we had, the main scenario was, it, like, it stated to you that it was an art, as something curving around the art of the aorta, right? Another way that it might come is that a patient who has an aortic aneurysm, 
Because when you have an aortic aneurysm, what happens is that your, your aorta is getting larger. And since it's getting larger, it's going to be pressing on the structures around it. And what was the structure curving around the aortic arch? It was your recurrent laryngeal nerve, okay? And also other questions, you might get another clue, which is the hoarseness of the sound. Whenever you, hit, you get hoarseness, it is associating with the recurrent laryngeal nerve, okay? So the three points that you must understand from this point is the aortic aneurysm, the hoarseness of the sound, or any artery curving around the aorta. All these are clues that the answer is the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the left one. Okay, clear? So this is another sample question that you might get. Uh, a patient who had a voice change. So any voice change is associated with the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the left one. And then there was an, a growth in the aortic arch. So it's the same concept. I think you guys are good with the concept. You guys answered the question correctly. So this is the second question. Um, during cardiac catheterization of a six-year-old child, the radiologist notes that the contrast medium released into the arch of the aorta is visible immediately in the left pulmonary artery. What is the most likely explanation for this finding? Are you guys answering? Uh, we get two more answers and then we'll go over the question. Okay. Uh, one last guy, someone answer. I mean, you guys also got the question right, so I'm just gonna go over. I think you guys know it. So yeah, so what happened is that we got a patent ductus arteriosus and it is because that it's connected directly between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you guys a follow-up question regarding to this point, or like a question that might come similar to this point. So we have this same scenario, and then another sentence come in, the doctor is trying to intervene in order to treat the patient. So he's trying to ligate or like close this ductus arteriosus. What is a structure that might be in danger or that might be at risk during this procedure? Left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Yes, you're right. It's the same concept that it's going to be rotating around the the art of the, the aorta. Okay, so, okay, I'm not gonna go over it, you guys know it. Mm, okay, so the next question. A 10 year old boy is admitted to the hospital with retrosternal discomfort. A CT scan reveals a midline tumor of the thymus gland. Which of the following veins would most likely be compressed by the tumor? Okay. So you guys also mostly got this question correct. Uh, I'm going to give you guys like 10 more seconds if anyone wants to take a chance answering. All right, so we got a different answer. So most of you said D and then we have an E. Um, so the right subclavian. Okay, so the correct answer was actually D, the left brachiocephalic. So okay, I'm going to explain the question now. Now what happens is that we have Okay, you mean the, yeah, okay, yes, you're right. So it's a thymus gland, and we were associating the thymus gland is going to be which part of the mediastinum? Superior anteriorly and inferior as well. Mm -hmm. It was most, mostly is the superior, if you're gonna get a cast about it. I saw that in the lecture you had inferior mediastinum, uh, but so no, most is going to be for the superior. But yes, as you said, so it's a midline tumor that's going to be affecting the thymus gland and, uh, so yeah, whenever you have this type of problems, we remember how I said the brachiocephalic was important because the left brachiocephalic is going to cross all the way from the left side in a long horizontal fashion to the right side. And so it could get compressed in this area. The two ways it could get compressed is by the, brach by the thymus gland, or you could have an aneurysm of the ascending aorta or like around the arch of the aorta that might be mentioned as, or like an anterior superior aneurysm of the ascending aorta. It was mentioned in one of the questions that there was an anterior superior aneurysm of the ascending aorta. So what is the structure that is going, I mean, there was an aneurysm of the ascending aorta and then what is the structure that is going to be found anterior superior to that? 
which is going to be around here, and this is going to be your, uh, your brachiocephalic vein, okay? The left branch of the brachiocephalic vein. So next question. A 47-year-old male is admitted to the emergency department due to severe dysphagia. Edema of the lower limbs is apparent upon physical examination. A barium sulfate swallow imaging produces reveal, uh, procedure reveals esophageal dilation with severe inflammation due to constriction at the esophageal hiatus. What is the most likely cause of the severe edema of the lower limbs? So we have two different answers so far. We have a D and we have a B. Uh, does anyone else want to try? Okay. So uh, we have a bunch of Ds and a bunch of Bs. So the correct answer, or like, does anyone want to try to explain it before? Does anyone want to try answering it? Like why you chose your answer? Okay, so and the actual correct answer here is going to be B, your thoracic duct blockage. Now, why is that? Because the patient said that the patient has edema. Now, usually edema is associated when there's increased fluids. Now, these fluids are going to be picked up by your lymphatic vessels. So if you know what edema is and that the fluids that are going to be accumulating in the tissues are going to be picked up by lymphatic vessels, then you can answer it. That is going to be a lymphatic vessel, which is the thoracic duct. However, if you don't know that it is, uh, it is the edema is associated with increased fluids and limited to the lymphatics, there is another clue that you have in this question, which is your esophageal dilation. If there is any dilation in the esophagus, remember we said that there was a structure that's always going to be behind the esophagus, and that structure was your thoracic duct. So when there is an enlargement of the thoracic duct, what happens is that it is going to be compressed. Okay, so when there is an enlargement of the, th of the esophagus, it is going to be compressing the thoracic duct, which is always going to be behind the esophagus. Okay. Uh, is it clear, you guys? Okay, I'm glad. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next question. A 78-year-old patient presents with an advanced cancer in the posterior mediastinum. The surgeons are in a dilemma to ask uh, as to how to manage the condition, which of the following structures is most likely damaged? I think this is a straightforward question. Mm -hmm. So we got a bunch of E's and the C. So the correct answer here is going to be E, which is the hemiazygous veins, as most of you answered. Now, I included this question because the arc of the azygous veins is tricky, but in the lecture, it was mentioned that the arch of the azygous veins is in the middle mediastinum. So like the middle mediastinum, all it has is going to be the heart and the arch of the azygous veins, like mostly associated with these structures and as well as the roots of the great vessels, but say mostly the heart and the arch of the azygous veins, okay? When we're talking about the posterior mediastinum, it is going to have the azygous and hemiazygous veins. There is a mnemonic to remember the structures that are going to be found in the posterior mediastinum. It is DATES, D-A-T-E-S. The D is for the descending aorta, A is for the azygous veins and the hemiazygous, so the azygous veins and the hemiazygous, and then the T is going to be for the thoracic duct, the E is going to be for the esophagus, which has the vagus nerves with it, because you can see it has the anterior and the posterior vagal trunks. And then you got the S for the sympathetic trunk. Now, how these structures are going to be organized is important because you might get another form of question that I will discuss in a second, okay? So the organization would be that you have most anteriorly the esophagus and always behind the esophagus is going to be your thoracic duct, okay? Now, to the left of the thoracic duct, which is also behind the esophagus, you're gonna have the aorta, and then to the right of it, you're going to have the azygous vein. Okay, so this is the organization. And then behind them, you got the sympathetic chain and the sympathetic trunks. 
Now, why is it important to remember that the esophagus is the most, most anterior structure in the posterior mediastinum? Is because whenever there is any hypertrophy of the left atrium or any case of a patient who has hypertension, which lead to an hypertrophy of the left atrium, the esophagus is going to be constricted. Okay? So, and this is not related to the previous question, but it's another type of question that they might get you. Well, a patient has a hypertensive, has a hypertensive patient uh, with a hypertrophy of the, of the left atrium. So what structure might be in damage or in risk, which is going to be the esophagus? Or you might get the question, which is, what structure of the posterior mediastinum is in direct contact with the pericardium, which is going to be the esophagus as well, okay? Um, is it clear, you guys, now? And one way to remember that uh, the, the aorta and the zygous vein, like which one is on the left and which one is on the right, I used to do that like whenever I'm trying to remember these stuff, is that if you remember, like if you look at the heart, to the right side of the heart, like at the right atrium and the right ventricle, you get the veins, the superior and the inferior vena cava. So the veins are usually associated with the right side. And then the aorta and the pulmonary arteries are usually associated with the left side. So throughout the body, like mostly whenever you look about like the great vessels, uh, like the one the aorta, the vein, the azygous, the superior, the inferior vena cava, the arteries are going to be on the left side, and then the veins are going to be on the right side. Okay, so this is like a way to remember it, if you get confused between which one's on the left and which is on the right. Okay, so the next question. A 34-year-old male unconscious patient is admitted to the hospital. His blood pressure is 85 over 45 millimeters of mercury. A centrovenous line is ordered to be placed. During subsequent radiographic examination, a chylothorax is detected. Which of the following structures was most likely accidentally damaged during the placement of the central venous line? Um, do you guys know what a chylothorax is? Okay, so you don't know what a chylothorax is. It's like a lymph collecting. Yeah, yes, you're right, you're right. So yes, chylothorax is like any problems or damage to the lymph. So there is a damage in the lymph vessel. Now you can try to answer this question. If you know that the color thorax is limited to them. I only got three answers. Let me give you guys more time to try to answer the question. So again, a chylothorax is damage to the lymphatic vessels. So we're mostly associating it with the damage to the thoracic duct. Okay. So we want uh, damage to the thoracic duct. Okay, I'll take one more answer and then we'll go over the question. So we got a bunch of Bs and a bunch of Cs. So the correct answer here is B, the site of the origin of the left brachiocephalic vein. Now, let's go over the explanation of the question. Now, what happens is that in your body, I don't think you got into much details about the thoracic duct, but it's really important to know that you have two main lymphatic ducts. The thoracic duct, which takes over most of the body, except the upper right part, which is being eliminated by the right lymphatic duct. Now, you don't need to focus about this one. Okay, just focus on the thoracic duct right now, okay? Now, the thoracic duct is going to be taking the lymph from around the body and then emptying it on the left side of the body, okay? Where does it empty? Into the left venous angle. The left venous angle is going to be made by the left internal jugular and the left subclavian. So the left subclavian vein and the left, I mean the left subclavian and the left internal jugular, together, they're going to create your left brachiocephalus. So... A left venous angle is associated or basically just referring to the site of formation of the left brachiocephalic vein. Okay. Now, if you look at the question again, like even if you didn't know that it is the left brachiocephalic vein, you could try to eliminate. You know that it is going to be a chylothorax or damage associated with the thoracic duct. Okay. So the thoracic duct from the slide, it says left internal jugular and the left subclavian. So external jugular is wrong. So A is wrong. Right side is wrong. Right side is wrong. And this is the right side also, so it's wrong. So you're only left with B. If you like, if you wanted to try elimination method, if you didn't know that the left venous angle is the site of origin of the left brachiocephalic vein. But like now you know. So if, in case you got it, you know it now. Okay. I'm um, sorry. Is it clear?
Okay, so I think we have one or two more questions for this. So, okay, this one is an X-ray. It most likely would be, uh, if you had the question coming in, I think it was explained in the lab or it should be in OSPI. Uh, so, but I found it when I was looking for questions, so I thought I might as well just add it in case some of you didn't know it. Okay, well, you guys immediately answered it correctly. So I think you guys are aware of it. I'm gonna give you two seconds just to get a couple more answers. Okay. And most of you answered the question correctly. So uh, the correct answer is the arch of the aorta. So yep, this is just referring to the aortic knuckle, which is part of the arch of the aorta, as you guys said. Uh, okay. Now this is a bonus question that I don't know if you guys took it, but I saw Khaled, he brought the question and you guys answered it correctly. So it was just, you guys could try to answer it again. Nope, you guys answered it correctly. It's A, it's the sympathetic chain. Uh, so that was it for the mediastinum lecture. Uh, you guys have any question regarding the media style? Do you want me to go over anything again before we go to the next lecture? Okay, all clear, I'm glad. Um, okay, so the next lecture is innervation of the thoracic viscera. Now this lecture might seem a little tough when you look at it outside, but and trust me, it's easy. And if you want, I could like, if you guys want, I could go over the actual slides of the lecture and like just tell you what is really important that you must know and what's not important. And I'm gonna go over the questions. So let's start with the questions. And if, okay, so you want me to you want me to go over the slides before or like after the questions? If you want me to go over them now or like after we try solving some questions. Okay, after solving some questions. Something before. Okay, let's try solving one or two questions. If most of you couldn't answer it, then we'll go over the slides because I got like mixed answers. Okay, let's try this question first. Two days after the patient's breathing had become assisted by mechanical ventilation, a patient with Guillain Barr syndrome began experiencing severe cardiac arrhythmias with perilously slow cardiac contractions resulting in reduced cardiac output. This most likely resulted from interruption of the contractile stimulus carried by which of the following? Now, questions in regarding to this lecture are going to be like kind of associated with physiology. So, and if you learn this part, I mean, if you're good with the physiology part, then, and you know about the anatomy, then you could get it right. I got two answers only so far. Okay. Now we got more answers. So, oh, wait, oops. Okay, so the correct answer here was C, the preganglionic sympathetic fibers. Like a bunch of you got it right. So, and I think you guys understood the question. So, what's happening here, you have a lot of words, William Barr syndrome, and a lot of fancy stuff. You don't really need to care about that. Your main point here is that a patient has reduced cardiac output, okay? So the question is asking, which of the following, or like this most likely result from interruption of the contractile stimulus carried by which of the following? Whenever there's a reduced cardiac output, from the physiology, you know, it's going to, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so whenever there's a reduced cardiac output, from physiology, you know that this is going to be your parasympathetic nervous system. So what is going to be interrupted it is going to be your sympathetic nervous system because there is over-exaggeration of the parasympathetic. Now, which of the following choices is going to be a sympathetic nervous system? Um, so there is the left vagus, which is the parasympathetic nerve. So it's immediately crossed out. There is the right phrenic. We cross it out because it's not related. There is the preganglion sympathetic fibers, which is the answer because there's sympathetic fibers which are going to be interrupted. And that's why it's C. There is cardiac pain fibers. The pain fibers are just for sensations. They're not really associated uh, with like increasing contractility or decreasing. So you just cross them out. And then the last part here is that the ventral horn neurons of spinal cord levels T1 to T4. Can anyone tell me why this choice is wrong? Uh, 
Why is it C? Why is it not E? Yes, you're right. Because the ventral horn is for the motor neuron. Yes, correct. It's not ventral, as you guys said. So the sympathetic and the sympathetic fibers are going to be found in the lateral horn or the intermediate horn, while the ventral horn is going to be for the motor fibers. That's why it is not the ventral horn. And if you said the dorsal horn, which is also going to be wrong, because the dorsal horn is for the sensory fibers. Okay, so it's not dorsal, it's not ventral. It's going to be your lateral or intermediate. Okay, uh, and this is the table that was found in the lecture. Um, so yeah, sympathetic innervation. This is not really related to the answer. I just put it in to see that it's the intermediate, it's not the ventral horn. Okay, so the next question. A 22-year-old marathon runner is admitted to the emergency department with severe dyspnea. Physical examination reveals that the patient is experiencing an acute asthma attack and the bronchodilating drug is administered. Which of the following elements of the nervous system must be inhibited by the drug to achieve relaxation of the smooth muscle of the tracheobronchial tree? This is also mostly physiology, so I expect you guys to get it right, inshallah. Okay, so I have... A or B, B, C's. Okay, so I have A's, B's, and C's. Mm, okay. Does anyone like to answer the question, like try answering it, or should I just go over the explanation? Like how, whenever you approach such a question, like what do you think of it? How, how do you try to answer it? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just go over it immediately. So what we have here is a patient who has an asthma attack, okay? And he took a bronchodilating drug because asthma is COPD, which is like an obstructive drug. So we need a dilating drug. Now, what the question is asking, this bronchodilating drug, it is going to dilate the bronchioles. It must inhibit something, right? So we took a sympathetic and parasympathetic, so parasympathetic and parasympathetic. So if you know what the sympathetic does and what the parasympathetic do, then you know the answers. So now like, does anyone want to change the answer? Because I got someone that changed the answer. Does anyone else want to try, try changing the answers? Okay, so, so I got two that changed their answers now. Now, the actual answer here is going to be C, which is the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers. Why is that? Because, okay, so I brought this in order to remember how, like, what the sympathetic system does and what the parasympathetic does. So sympathetic is going to be fight or flight. You all know that. And it decreases cardiac output. And also you guys know that already. And then the parasympathetic is decreasing that. But most of the people get confused with the part of the bronchodilation, the bronchoconstriction, because it's a little different. How you want to think of it is whenever you're trying to like, for example, in a flight mode, okay, you're trying to run very fast. You want to be able to catch your breath. You want to be able to get in a good breath so that you don't pass out. If you can't breathe, you're going to pass out. So if you're trying to run, you want to get in a good breath, right? So you're going to have to open up your lungs. So bronchodilations. As you're increasing your cardiac activity, you want to open up your lungs so you can breathe better. So this is the sympathetic nervous system. You want to associate it with that, okay? Well, the parasympathetic nervous system, there is a decreased cardiac activity, and you already know that, okay? But the bronchoconstriction part is because you're not trying to run. You're just sitting down. You don't really need to get in a very deep breath. You don't need to get in a good fast breath, okay? So you can have your uh, bro or like bronchioles constricted. Now that we know that what the sympathetic and what parasympathetic does, we can go back to the question. So we have a bronchodilating drug. So if it's a drug that's bronchodilating, it is going to be stimulating what? The sympathetic or the parasympathetic? Which do you guys think? Which one is stimulated? Which system? Sympathetic. Yes, the sympathetic. It's not the parasympathetic. Because parasympathetic is rest and digest. So you don't really, you don't want to run. So you basically constricting. Like forget constrict and dilate. I know it's different in the veins because vasoconstriction and vasodilation is associated with the sympathetic. Just think of breathing. You want to breathe more or you want to breathe less, okay? If you want to breathe more, so you want to activate your sympathetic. If you want to breathe, le breathe less, so you want to activate your parasympathetic. So breathing more is going to be associated with bronchodilation, okay? So that's why it's sympathetic. 
And so which one must be inhibited is going to be the other one, which is the parasympathetic. Okay, is it clear, guys, now? Okay. Uh, the next question. A 15-year-old male is admitted to the hospital with cough and severe dyspnea. Physical examination reveals expiratory wheezes and the diagnosis is made of acute asthma. The expiratory wheezes are characteristic signs of bronchospasmings of the smooth muscles of the bronchial airways. Which of the following nerves could be blocked to result in relaxation of the smooth muscles? I got only one answer so far. Okay. Okay, now we got more answers. I'll give you guys like a couple of seconds to try and answer. So we got C's and we got D's. I mean, I think you guys are still confused a little bit about the topic. So like, does anyone want to try explaining it now? Does anyone want to try explaining the answer? Because I explained it to you the previous time. I want to see why what you guys why you guys thought it's like it's different this time. Would it be um C vagus because it's parasympathetic and that's rest and digest? Yes. So which of the following nerves could be blocked to result in the relaxation? So you think the answer is C? Okay, so you're right, no, I the answer is C, because as she said, we're trying to have uh, a rest and digest, okay? Uh, to result in relaxation of the smooth muscles, okay? So if we try, okay, so the question asked here that we have, we need a relaxation of the smooth muscles. So if you're trying to relax the smooth muscles, uh, you're basically trying to open up the lungs, right? Because you're relaxing them. And if you want to open up the lungs, when do you usually want to open up the lungs? If you're trying to run, if you're trying to do activity, so in a sympathetic nervous system situation. So if you block the sympathetic nervous system, what's going to happen? You're going to constrict more. So you don't end up with relaxation. Your main clue here is which of the following nerves is going to end up in relaxing it. Is it the sympathetic or parasympathetic? We need to activate the, the sympathetic, I mean, right? So we can't block the sympathetic. We need to block the parasympathetic. That's why the answer is C. Again, I'm gonna go over this slide, like take a look at it and try to understand what's happening. Uh, let me erase what I said. Okay. So just whenever you approach these questions, take a second, read it slowly, understand what's happening. Sympathetic nervous system, you're trying to run, you're trying to do activity. So you wanna open up your lungs, you wanna breathe better, okay? Parasympathetic, you don't wanna do any activities, you don't really wanna breathe better. So you're just closing up the lungs, okay? You're just sitting down. You don't really need to take in deep and fast breaths. So it doesn't really matter if your lungs are open up so much, okay? Your lungs are open up so much. So sympathetic is associated with bronchodilation and the parasympathetic is bronchoconstriction. Now, if you look at the question, the question said that we want to result or like end up in relaxation of the smooth muscles. If we're trying to relax the smooth muscles, so we're trying to open them up more. If we're trying to open them up more, then which system is that, sympathetic or parasympathetic? If you're trying to open up your lungs more. Sympathetic. Sympathetic. Yes. It is the sympathetic. So then which one should be blocked? Parasympathetic. Parasympathetic. So that's why the answer is C. Is it clear now? You're not in a rush. Whenever you get any question, like just take a second. Think of what's happening. Think of just tricky points. Like, I'm not going to lie. When you first told me the answer, I got confused for a second because I didn't look at the word blocked. So just take a second. Look what's happening. See, like, understand like, any type of trick points that you have in the question and then answer it. Okay, is it better now? You guys all good with it? I hope I have another question of those. I'm not sure, though. I want to check if you guys did really understand it. Uh, so yeah, I'm just showing you here that the vagus nerve is going to be for the parasympathetic nervous system. And okay, so we have another question. 41 year old female is admitted to the emergency department with a complaint of severe, sharp, but poorly localized pain on the chest wall. 
Radiographic examination gives evidence of pleural occlusion. What is the location of the neuronal cell bodies responsible for the nerve fibers that carry this pain to the central nervous system? Uh, so I have different answers. There's I got A's and I got D's. Does anyone else want to try A's or D's? Okay, so the correct answer here is A. Okay, so the person that said D changed to an A. Right? Oh, wait, no. I didn't get a D. Did I get a D? Okay, never mind. I didn't get a D. You guys all got it right. I'm sorry. <laughs> so it's a dorsal throat ganglia because it is sensory. I know that the fibers of the sensation for the visceral or the organs are going to be coming from the sympathetic or coming or like hitchhiking with the sympathetic fibers. However, their final destination, any sensory fibers, the final destination is at the dorsal root ganglia. Okay. So since it's sensory fibers, it is going to go over to the dorsal root ganglia. And if you look at the slides here, the picture of the slides that you had, so the fibers are going to be coming over with the sympathetic. Right? At first, they're going to be moving with the sympathetic. However, their final destination is going to be the dorsal root ganglia around here. Any sensations are going to be at the dorsal root ganglia. Okay, I think this is the last question. A 45-year-old man is admitted to the hospital with severe chest pain radiating to his left arm and left upper jaw. An emergency ECG reveals an acute myocardial infarction of the posterior left ventricular wall. Which of the following spinal cord segments would most likely receive sensations of pain in this case? Okay, we've got, so I think most of you said B, uh, which is the right answer, T1, 2, 3, and 4. It's just a recall question. So the, the sympathetic fibers are going to be for the heart, and this area is going to be by the uh, T1, 2, 3, and 4. I think that's the last question, yes. So if you guys have any questions regarding that lecture, the innervation of the sympathetic, and I'm going to leave this slide so that you guys can take another look at it. And do you have any questions about this one or the media sign lecture? Okay, you have a question. Oh, you can type in your question in public chat in case people want to see it. Um, I have a question about the picture. You know the diagram for the thoracic nerve supply? Uh, this one? Uh, no. It was. The Wait, was it here? Or? Yes, this is picture. Oh, this one. Wait. This one. Yeah. No, no, the one before. Yes, this one. Uh, there were a lot of questions in the books. And oh, the last. Okay, like, okay, this question you want. No, no, no. The diagram. Wait, there's a diagram here? The side no, the one. The one you put was it was right. I think her thing is a little late, so she's oh, not getting this that. one. Oh, okay. yeah, this one. This one is right. Yes, this one. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, there are questions in the book. The last, like, this structure is damaged. What neurons are affected? So, so like in the ventral horn, do we say just motor or also um, preganglionic sympathetic? Because you can see like the line for the preganglionic sympathetic also passing. Uh, pre okay, so you know where the pre ganglionic sympathetic is. It is this one, right? Mm. Usually, it's going. To, if you get questions like that, like for us in Euro now, whenever we get like such questions, I don't know why the color is purple now. I can change it. Uh, okay, there we go. I like red more. So yeah, so whenever we get questions like that, it is going to be ventral horn associated with motor, like somatic nervous system, and the lateral horn is going to be for the sympathetic. Yes, true. The fibers do pass through here. But it's not really like a sig it's not really significant because because like the symp sympathetic usually are only from like T two to L four or like T two T one to L two, and whenever you get questions, it's, plus I don't think you want to you're gonna get questions like that. But ventral horn is just motor, okay? Ventral horn is just motor. What about the ramus? At least six. Six. Okay. The vent. This is the ventral ramus. Uh, this I think this is the spinal root, uh, the, right? I think it was the root called, or I'm not. I think it was the root, yeah. So this one, 
you I don't think we you get damage to this specific part. I, I don't I'm not, I don't think you get specific damage to this part. You, like these questions are neural level. I don't want to discuss them because for you, you're not even gonna get questions about the ventral horn and the lateral horn. I'm not I don't think you're gonna get I only think that you're gonna get the questions similar to the ones that we wrote. But ventral horn damage Thank is going you. to be associated with motor. Lateral horn is gonna be for the atomic and the posterior horn is for sensations. Uh, ventral roots, you won't really get questions about it. And I think that's it's sympathetic chain, you're gonna get Horner syndrome. Okay, thank you. Okay, no worries. Any other questions you guys have? You want me to go over the extra lecture slides? Well, how else you guys good with it? Unless, okay. All right, thank you guys so much for attending the lecture. Um, again, most of from that lecture, all you need to really focus on is this part because and you were asking me questions about this slide. For us last year, they, they literally bring this part in every block, in CVP, GIT, uh, renal, and MSK, I think, I'm not sure. But you, you don't really get asked about them. You just want you just want you to know what the nerves, like this part. Right? Uh, you just want you to know this part, okay? Good. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Uh, if you have any questions, my number here is Khalid's number here as well. Uh, we'll go over and just let us know. We can answer or you can just stop us in the uni anytime. We have no worries answering you guys' questions. And best of luck in your exam. Inshallah, you'll all do amazing. And thank you.